The following message is by Pastor Jason Polly. More information from Harmony Bible Church is available at www.harmonybible.org. Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome once again to Harmony Bible Church. It's great to be here in the house of the Lord worshiping Him this morning. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the opportunity we have to be here to worship you this morning. God, I pray that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. God, I pray for the churches that are meeting up and down the coast and around the world today. I pray especially for uh, Spruce Head Community Church that's meeting the same time right now. God, that you would bless them, encourage them, work mightily in their midst. God, I thank you for uh, just a partner in preaching the gospel here in this community. God, I just pray and ask that you would be with us, that you would just uh, change our hearts, that you would draw us closer to you, God, that we may be transformed as we interact with and look at your word this morning. We pray these things in Christ's name, amen. So today we're going to pick up where we left off in our journey through Christ's letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Today we're going to be looking at the church in Philadelphia. So before we look at our text this morning, though, I want to give you a little bit of background information on the city of Philadelphia. As you're probably aware, the the name Philadelphia comes from the Greek term for brotherly love. However, the city of Philadelphia had actually changed its name a couple of times in history as a way of honoring the emperor. So at one point they called themselves Neo-Caesarea after the Caesar. And then also Flavia, which is named after the emperor's wife. So the city of Philadelphia had changed its name and was seeking to honor the emperor and seeking to uh, uh, gain some political clout as they did so. The city of Philadelphia was located approximately 30 miles southeast of Sardis. Uh, It was a relatively young city and had only been founded about 250 years before this letter was written. And history reports that Uh, Philadelphia was a center for Greek language and culture, and it was also the base from which those ideas could then be spread throughout the region. So it was a a missionary city, if you will, of spreading the good news of Hellenism or Greek thought. So Philadelphia was kind of looked to as the city where Greek thought could be spread throughout the entire region. And Philadelphia was also the epicenter of a great earthquake in AD 17 which uh, not only caused significant damage to the buildings and the city walls, but also resulted in many uh, tremors and aftershocks for years to come. So when you combine that with the fact that the areas outside of the city was surrounded by volcanic soil, which was suitable for vineyards, you can see where many of the people did not live within the city, but lived outside of the city and were actually farmers. And we don't know the details of how the gospel first came to the city of Philadelphia, But we do know from this letter that the gospel came in power and that people's lives were transformed and that the church was established. So that's just a little bit of background on that city. So without further ado, let's look at our text this morning. We're going to look at Revelation 3, verses 7 through 13. If you'll stand with me for the reading of God's Word. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door, which no one can shut, because you have a little power and have kept my word, but have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them, make them know that I have loved you because you have kept my word of perseverance. I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the applying of His Word. Amen. You may be seated. So let's start off by examining the way Jesus, the author of this letter, introduces himself to this church. In verse 7, he refers to himself as the one who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens. In these opening words to the church in Philadelphia, Jesus is reminding them of four specific elements of his character. Number one, he says that he is holy. The word holy simply means set apart. And Jesus is set apart from sin and set apart to righteousness. In other words, Jesus is without sin and entirely righteous. He is the only one who can make this claim. For Scripture teaches that all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. And each of us has turned his own way. But praise God when we read the rest of that passage, the rest of that verse, We know that it also says that the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on Him. So while we will never live perfectly holy lives, though we are indeed called to grow in holiness, to continue to set ourselves apart for Him, we will never live perfectly holy lives. We know that His holiness, Christ's holiness, has been reckoned to our account. And Christ reminds us here, reminds the church of Philadelphia, and ultimately us, that He is holy. And number two, he says that he is true. Number two, he says that he is true. Jesus makes it clear that he's not only telling the truth, but that he is the truth. You see, he stands in contrast to the false gods and the empty philosophy of the day. Psalm 86, 11 says, Teach me your ways, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. And then John, Jesus in John 14, 6 says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. You see, the path to God, the only way to God is to walk in His truth through Jesus. For Jesus is the truth. He's God incarnate. God in the flesh. For Just as John 1.14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, Jesus is true. He is the one true God. And then number three, he says that he has the key of David. This is a reference to the sovereignty of Jesus. And I heard an interesting uh, definition of sovereignty this past week. Bill and Sue and Kim and I went away to a conference, and at the conference the speaker said that sovereignty is the, the meaning of sovereignty is the unlimited right to do as one pleases. That Jesus has the unlimited right to do as He pleases. And that's what He's saying here. He's saying, I have the key of David. See, the one who holds a key in their hand has the right to grant or deny access. Uh, Just uh, earlier, um, uh, I was trying to uh, get into the, I was going to get into the office, and I don't have a key to the office. You need to find somebody who has a key to grant access, right? Or if Uh, If you were to come in, you show up for church early and you don't have a key, you need to wait until somebody has the key to let you in because they have the right to grant or deny that access as the holder of that key. So the key is a symbol of authority. And the key of David that Jesus is speaking of here is the authority that comes from being the Messiah, the promised descendant of David. He says, I am a descendant of David The one, the coming Messiah, the one who would reign and rule in righteousness forever. At the beginning of this book, in uh, verse 118, Jesus told John, he said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. You see, Jesus wants the church in Philadelphia to remember that as the Messiah He has ultimate authority over all things, including life and death itself. That Jesus is sovereign. So he says, I am sovereign. I hold the key of David. And then number four, he says that he is the one who opens and no one will shut. And the one who shuts 
and no one opens. You see, not only does Jesus have the right, the authority to do as He pleases, but He has the power to accomplish what He wills. There's a difference here. One says, I have the right to do this. The other says, I actually have the power to see that it is accomplished. And that's what Jesus has. He has the the power to accomplish whatever He wills. You see, it's easy to talk about Jesus as being all-powerful but then live as though he's actually the victim of circumstance. And I think sometimes our theology is actually closer to that. We say Jesus is all-powerful, but we look at Jesus as though he's really the victim of whatever's happening in the world or the victim of the poor choices that people make. And the Bible does not teach that God set the world in motion and then stepped back and watched to see how things would play out. That's not Scripture. That's not Christianity. It also doesn't teach that he knows how things will play out, but he's by and large uninvolved and doesn't really have the ability to change things. But that's the religion of our day. That's the culture of our day. That God is this distant God who kind of set things in motion and then stepped back. And now he's a victim waiting to see what's going to happen and how things are going to play out. But that is not the Jesus of the Bible. That's not what Scripture teaches. Scripture teaches that he is all-powerful. The same Jesus that calmed the storm, that fed 5,000 people, that raised Lazarus from the dead, He's alive and just as powerful today. You see, He's no less able to calm the storms of your life. He's no less able to provide food to feed you. Not, Not only your body, but also your soul. And He's no less able to raise you to newness of life. You see, through faith in Jesus Christ, He can indeed do that. And Jesus wants the church in Philadelphia to know that He is all-powerful. Whatever He opens cannot be closed. And whatever He closes cannot be opened. He is all-powerful. So now let's look at what Jesus, the One who is holy, true, sovereign, and all-powerful, look at what He says to this church in Philadelphia. The first point in our sermon outline is, number one, the opportunity. The opportunity. Look at verse 8 again with me. Revelation 3, verse 8. I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door, which no one can shut, because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Here we see that just like the church in Smyrna, which we studied a few weeks ago, Jesus only has words of commendation and no rebuke. That with these two churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, He only uh, has these words of of commendation for them, these these words of lifting them them up, and He has absolutely no rebuke. And He says, I know your deeds. I'm intimately familiar with your deeds, your works. And then He notes the following about them. First, He says, they have little power. The NASB, the New American Standard, I think kind of muddies the understanding of this phrase a little bit. Generally like uh, this text and like to use the NASB, but I think the other English translations actually do a better job conveying what Jesus is actually saying here. The NIV says, I know you have little strength. The RSV and the ESV both say, I know that you have but little power. You see, the church in Philadelphia would have likely consisted of a small minority of the population living there. It's not highly unlikely that Jesus would call out a remnant, for God has dealt with a remnant throughout history. A small remnant of people would have come to know Christ, would have come to serve Christ, to be part of the church in Philadelphia, but the large, the vast majority of the people would not have been Christians in Philadelphia. So they're small in number, not mighty in power. They would have had very little influence at least from a worldly perspective, especially in a culture that was all about promoting all things Greek, that was all about promoting the Hellenistic lifestyle and Greek culture. And these Christians, very, very little power in that world. Paul, in writing to the church in Corinth, reminded them of the same thing. In 1 Corinthians 1, 26-29, we read this. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God 
has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. The things that are not, so that He may nullify the things that are. So that no man may boast before God. See, Jesus says, you have but little power. You're not strong, you're not mighty, you're just like us. We're not strong or mighty. You, you look at the, this area and the people, the homes where people are, they're home right now. They're not here at church. They're not worshiping the Lord this day. And we're not strong in number. We're not mighty in power. And he's saying the same thing to this church in Philadelphia. You're not powerful by the world's standards. Just as in Corinth, there were not many wise, not many noble. They had but little, little power. But please... Do not understand this as a criticism. For notice that in spite of their weakness, Jesus says, they have kept His Word. They have kept His Word. They've held fast to His teaching. They've walked in obedience to Him. And they have not denied His name. You see, they've recognized that there was no other name under heaven by which they might be saved. They confessed, just as Peter did, where else would we go, Lord? As Peter said, where would we go other than to you? You have the words of eternal life. So the church in Philadelphia, though they had little power, they kept His word. They held fast to His name. And Jesus tells them that the result of their faithfulness is an open door. If you look at verse 8, He says, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can open because... You have but little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. So he says, you've kept my word. You have little power. You've kept my word. You have not denied my name. And because of that, he says, I have put before you an open door. An open door which no one can shut. See, this door is an opportunity to further the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. It's the same open door that Paul spoke of in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 8-9, through when he said, but I will remain in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective service has opened for me, and there are many adversaries. We see the same term used again in 2 Corinthians 2, verses 12 through 13. Paul says, Now when I came to Trous for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened for me in the Lord, I had no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. So he says, I came, and there was a door that was open for me, and I went on to Macedonia, and I proclaimed the gospel there. And then in Colossians 4, verses 2 through 4, we read, Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up to us a door for the word, that He'll give us this opportunity to share the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have been also imprisoned, with, that I make it clear in the way I ought to speak. So he says, pray that an open door would be given to me that I may proclaim the gospel. <laughs> and in the same way, Jesus is telling this church, this church in Philadelphia, that even though they had but little power, because they have not denied his name and have been obedient to him, he has set an opportunity for them to grow in faithfulness an opportunity to further the gospel, an opportunity to be used by Him to bring Him glory. So having seen this opportunity, an open door for the gospel, for the furtherance of the gospel, now let's look to the second point in our sermon outline. Number two, the promise. Number two, the promise. And you're thinking right now, wow, I wish Pastor Jason had a cold every week because he's really flying through the, the points today. He's already on point number two. Number two is the promise. Look at verses 9 through 10 with me. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my, the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. This is the same description given of the Jews to the letter to the church in Smyrna. 
You remember from several weeks ago, the same exact description, the, this, uh, those who say they are Jews but are not, but lie, and the, the, instead they are from the synagogue of Satan. As we saw in the letter to Smyrna, you see, you cannot be ambivalent about Jesus. You're, you're either for Him or you're against Him. And by rejecting Jesus as the Messiah, the promised one, the Jews in Smyrna, and now Philadelphia, were rejecting God. And therefore, they were agreeing with or siding with the devil. Listen to Jesus' words in John 8, 37-45. through 45. He says this, I know that you are Abraham's descendants. He's speaking to the Jews. I know that you're Abraham's descendants. Right? I know that you're Jews, that you call yourselves Jews. Yet, you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I have seen with my father. Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. This, seeking to kill me, this Abraham did not do. You were de doing the deeds of your father. They said to him, we were not born of forn fornication. We have one father, God. And Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God. For I did not even come on my own initiative, but of he who sent me. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak in truth, you do not believe me. So Jesus says in the same way, he says, you say you're Jews, you say you're descendants of Abraham, but you've rejected me. You lie. You are a liar because your father is a liar. You're part of the synagogue of Satan. See, they're not, they haven't trusted Christ or trusted God at all. They may call themselves by whatever name they want, but they're trusting in their ancestry and not living by faith. Just like the Jews in John 8 who said, Abraham is our father, these Jews here in Philadelphia were trusting in the fact that they were Jews by birth. And just as the Jews in Smyrna were hostile toward the Christians, so also the Jews in Philadelphia were probably bringing about the same kind of persecution and false accusations against the Christians there. So while the church is facing some opposition, some persecution, especially by the Jews, notice what Jesus promises to those who are His in Philadelphia. Number one, he says, I will make them come and bow down at your feet. The ultimate act of humility. The ultimate act of submission. He says, those who, who are persecuting you now, who reject me, they will ultimately see one day that you are right. They will come and they will bow down at your feet for they will recognize that you knew the Messiah. That they will place themselves in a position where they humble themselves before you. Though they respond in pride right now, not because of you, Church of Philadelphia, but because of me, because they hate me, one day they will be humbled. And then number two, he says, I will keep you from the hour of testing. This uh, verse here, many would argue that it's a, a strong evidence for the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Uh, verse 10 because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come on the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So the idea is that this verse is speaking of the tribulation, a time in which great distress will come upon the world, and that Jesus is going to rescue, He's going to take His church out of the world prior to that happening. They will not have to endure that time of testing. It's certainly possible that that's what this um, verse is referring to. It's certainly, um, uh, I think, it, it, you know, I certainly could, could lean that way. However, I want to say this. 
That's an entirely different sermon. We could spend another 45 minutes just talking about that particular point and the whole eschatology, and I don't want to get bogged down in that right now. The point is, there's coming a day, a day in which all unbelievers will face judgment. And I think clearly the text is talking about unbelievers facing judgment. He says, I will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come on the whole world. This phrase, the whole world, is used throughout the book of Revelation to refer to unbelievers. Look at Revelation 6.10. Just uh, next page over, a couple of pages over. Revelation 6.10. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So this idea of those who dwell on the earth, right? That those are the unbelievers. And the idea is, in verse 10, that hour which is about to come on the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth, that He's going to judge the unbelievers. Uh, Revelation 8.13, same, same phrase, those who dwell on the earth, says this, Then I looked and I heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. So the idea is, there is a day in which judgment is coming for the unbelievers. And Jesus says, I will keep you from that judgment. I will keep you from that hour of testing. And we can argue whether that's talking about the tribulation or what that's talking about, but the point is, there's a day coming. There's a day coming in which unbelievers will face that judgment. They'll face that hour of testing. And Jesus says, I will rescue you from that. I will rescue you. Praise God. For 1 Thessalonians 1.10, which we saw in Sunday school, which says, and He will rescue us from the wrath to come. So having seen the opportunity that there's an open door to be used for the furtherance of the Gospel, and then also seeing the promise that though things may be difficult, Jesus will rescue them. He's going to rescue them in the trials that they're facing. They won't last forever. That though there's persecution that's happening, that, that though there are some who want to kill the Christians, that though there are some who want to persecute the Christians, that those trials, they won't last forever. That a day is coming, a day is coming where Jesus will rescue them from that hour of testing that's going to come on the whole world. That they will not face that judgment. So having considered those things, now let's consider the third point in our sermon outline. The third point is the outcome. Number three, the outcome. Look at verses 11 through 13 with me. Revelation 3 Verses 11 through 13. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. See, the language of this section is incredibly rich. And I think it's hard sometimes for us, we miss the point when we just read this text. And I don't know about you, but the number of times where I've read Scripture, and I've sat down to read, and then I've thought, what did I just read? And then I read it again, and I think, what did I just read? Sometimes it's hard work and we miss the, the beautiful language. And some of it's cultural. Some of it is a, maybe we don't understand the, the original language in which this was written. Some of it is we don't understand the culture in which it's written or the background. But the language here is, inc is incredibly rich. See, Jesus tells the believers of Philadelphia that He's coming quickly. He says, I'm coming quickly and you should remain steadfast in your faith. And then He uses the following imagery to show how glorious heaven is going to be for these saints. He says that these believers, they will be a pillar in the temple of God. And then he says, and they will have God's name, the name of the new Jerusalem, and Jesus' new name written on them. So he says, you, you're going to be a temple. And written on you is going to be, is going to be God's name. 
There's going to be the name of the new Jerusalem, the new city, and there's going to be Jesus' new name written on you. And you think, wow, that is amazing. And then you're thinking, what does that mean, right? Well, what is all that about? You see, no longer will they need to go in and out of the city, a city constantly rocked by earthquakes and marked by instability. No longer will they live in a city where the walls are cracked and crumbling and there's constant tremors and there's instability. No longer will they live in a city that is changing with the wind, that's renaming itself and fashioning itself after the latest ruler. Instead, they can be sure that the future that they look forward to is one where they can remain firmly planted as if they're a pillar. That they will be a pillar in the temple of God. And written on that firmly planted pillar would be the name of their God. For they belong to Him. He says, my name will be written on you because, because you belong to me. And the name of the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, the city that will never change its name, will be written on that pillar. Because this city, it's going to be perfect. And it doesn't need to change. And lastly, also written on them, the firmly planted pillar, written on them, will be the new name of Jesus. To be clear, this new name that Jesus has is not because Jesus will be changed. We know that Jesus does not change. But instead, because they will be changed. You see, when they're planted as a pillar in this temple, that when they live and dwell in this city, that they will see Jesus as they have never seen Him before. They will finally see Him clearly. The future they have to look forward to includes seeing Jesus as He truly is. What appears dim right now will be made perfectly clear. Just as the Apostle John said it would be in 1 John 3, 3 2, where we, write, we, we read this, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. But we know that when He appears, we will be like Him, because we will see Him just as He is. It says that in this new heavenly city, that you will see Jesus just as He is. That you see Him unclearly now, but there's coming a day when you will see Him very clearly. So let's review. We've seen the opportunity. Jesus comes to them and He says, there's an opportunity. An open door has been set before you. An opportunity to spread the Gospel. Not just Hellenism. Not just Greek thought. But something far better than what our world offers. Something far better than what your culture offers. Instead of spreading Greek thought, I've set an open door before you to spread the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And then He gives them a promise. He says, difficult times may come, but it will not last forever. I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to rescue you in the, the hour of testing that the world's going to face. You won't have to face it. And then lastly, the outcome. For those who hold fast to the name of Jesus, to the one who endures to the end, they will be like a pillar, steady and strong, abiding forever with Christ in heaven. Here's the line you've all been waiting for. So how do we apply all of this to our lives here at Harmony Bible Church? Well, what we ask ourselves is, what is the one who is holy, true, sovereign, and all-powerful saying to us this morning? What is the Lord Jesus, who has declared Himself to be holy, true, sovereign, and all-powerful, what is He saying to us as we look at this text? Well, number one, I pray that we see the opportunity that is set before us. I pray that every one of you will see the open door for the furtherance of the gospel. That though we may have but little power, right, we're not mighty in strength. We're not mighty in number. That we are called to proclaim His message nonetheless. We're, we're called to proclaim His message of salvation to a lost and dying world around us. Though we live in a world where there are many messages being promoted, the message of the gospel is unlike any other. See, we don't need to be mighty in power. 
We don't need to be mighty in number because it's not us who are mighty anyway. We don't need that. The message itself is mighty. That Jesus is mighty to save. He is the one who is all-powerful. And all we do is go out and proclaim the message even in our weakness. Every week when I prepare a message, I say, Lord, I cannot do this. Lord, please do this through me, not because of me, but in spite of me. And I'll pray that prayer several times throughout the week because it's not about me and I can't do it in my strength. And it's the same with each one of us. We have but little power, but we are called to be obedient to Him, to hold fast to His Word and bring that message of hope to the world around us. And I pray that as a church we are serious about reaching our community, reaching our loved ones with the Gospel of Christ. Number two, we must remember that even though difficult times may come, even though we may face opposition, we have a great and mighty rescuer. That we have a great, great and mighty rescuer whose name is Jesus. And that He has promised that He will rescue us from the wrath that is to come. That by faith in Him, we can be rescued. Praise Him for that. And then number three, we must set our sights toward heaven and look for the day when Christ returns. That as we do that, we must hold fast to the name of Jesus, knowing that one day we will see Him just as He is, and we will abide with Him in, in heaven forever. And that should be our motivation. You see, our motivation is Jesus Himself. It's not as though heaven is even the motivation, or the city is the motivation. It's all about Jesus. It's the, the beauty of the new Jerusalem is being able to dwell with Jesus eternally. And praise Him for that. So that's my prayer. That we're able to hold fast in the midst of difficulty because our eyes are set toward heaven. And that when our eyes are set toward heaven, we see those open doors and we walk through those open doors and we further the Gospel of Christ for His glory. Let's pray. Father God, I thank You for today, for Your grace. God, I thank You that though we have but little power, that You are all-powerful. God, that You have given us the ability to proclaim Your Word, not by our own strength, but by the strength that You give us, the strength that comes only from You through the power of Your Holy Spirit. God, I just pray and ask that You'd help us to be faithful. God, I pray that each one of us here would hold fast to Your name. God, I pray that each one of us here would be obedient to Your Word. And that as we do so, there would be more and more opportunities to further that Gospel. Opportunities for ministry. More open doors to share Your Word. God, help us to be faithful in doing so. God, give us the grace we need. God, for we cannot do this in our own strength. We need Your strength, Lord. God, I just pray and ask that we would be uh, setting our sights toward heaven looking to You, enduring to the end, knowing that You are faithful and that You will rescue us from the wrath that is to come. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for listening to this message from Jason Polly, pastor of Harmony Bible Church in South Thomaston, Maine. Feel free to share this message with others, and for more information about Harmony Bible Church, visit www.harmonybible.com. God bless, and to God be the glory.